everyone. I am your host, Bill Thompson III. This Birding Life is hosted by Bird Watchers Digest, the magazine for birders who love to read and readers who love to read. Enjoy our content in print and digital form via our website, birdwatchersdigest.com, where you can read articles and order a subscription to a bird magazine, or enjoy it in person at one of our many events for birders, such as the American Birding Expo, also a sponsor of This Birding Life. The American Birding Expo is a retail consumer event that brings you, the bird watcher, the entire world of birding in one place. The 2017 Expo is going to be just outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, September 29 to October 1. Details at birdingexpo.com. The lead sponsor for This Birding Life is Carl Zeiss Sports Optics. Makers of fine optics for birders and other outdoor enthusiasts. Join the Carl Zeiss nature community at facebook.com slash Zeiss birding. Carl Zeiss, we make it visible. This is episode 67, Katie Fallon, Vulture Evangelist. Katie Fallon is an author, teacher, and naturalist who lives and works in West Virginia. She has taught creative writing in the past at the university level, so it only seemed natural that she become a published author herself. That particular accomplishment came true in 2011 with the publication of Cerulean Blues, a personal search for a vanishing songbird, which won widespread acclaim among readers and book reviewers. I first met Katie after I read this book, when she came to speak at the New River Birding and Nature Festival in Fayetteville, West Virginia, which features cerulean warblers as one of its most attractive and most abundant birds. People go to that festival just to see cerulean warblers. Katie is also one of the founders of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving wild birds through scientific research, outreach, and public education, and through rescue and rehabilitation. It's based near Morgantown, West Virginia, and treats more than 200 injured wild birds annually, as well as conducting environmental education programs and sponsoring some citizen science research projects. Katie's been a lifelong resident of Appalachia. Her great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather and her grandfather were all coal miners in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Both of her parents were public school teachers. She lives now in Cheat Neck, West Virginia, with her daughters Laurel and Cora, her spouse Jesse, her beagle-ish rescue dogs, Liza Jane and Sally Ann, and her formerly wild horses, Rosie and Ranger. Katie's one of those rising stars among the uh, naturalist writer crowd, and uh, here's my conversation with her, which we recorded at the Birdwatcher's Digest offices just a little while ago. Katie, thanks for driving over from Motown to uh, Marietta. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to see you, and we're going to see each other in in a few weeks at New River, which is always a treat. Yes. Um, Katie's the author of Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. And I've got to ask right from the get-go here, Katie, why vultures? I have always been sort of fascinated with vultures ever since I noticed a group of them roosting near where I lived while I was in graduate school at West Virginia University. There were probably 10 or 15 turkey vultures that would roost in the same dead tree Mm -hmm. right when I got off the interstate to go to my house. Mm -hmm. And they kind of became friends who I would drive past every day and yeah. sort of say, oh, there they are. There they are. And you they knew are. what they were because you were already kind of a birder at that time? Yeah, and turkey vultures are, once you kind of know what a turkey vulture looks like, you see them everywhere. Right. Um, and they are literally almost everywhere in the United States. Um, here in Ohio or West Virginia or Pennsylvania, you can see a turkey vulture probably almost any day of the year. Mm-hmm. Except maybe January and February, you might not see as many. But that's something that's changed since I was a kid here, growing up in Marietta and birding in West Virginia. We, you know, the vultures would leave in the winter, and they would come back when, you know, when things started thawing and the, you know, the the basically when the small mammals came out of hibernation and started migrating to find new territories and were getting hit on the roads. That's to me, timing wise, that was when we would see them. Yeah, it's also probably when uh, carcasses started to remain thawed right so carcasses wouldn't freeze right away because vultures can't like breathe on the carcass or sit on them like a great horned owl will do to thaw the meat yeah no i don't think they poop on them right i don't think they do that right so i mean so where did your fascination with we're going to come back to vultures 
in a little bit, but where did your fascination with birds start in your life? How did you get going with birds in the first place? Birds um, have always been in my life, a part of my life, I guess. Uh, my mother tells me my first word was bird. Yeah. And a good. lot of people don't believe me when I it's tell them sign. that. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. I haven't stopped really talking about them. Mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> Um, but my mother is a retired librarian, and she keeps lots of detailed notes about everything. She mm -hmm. also alphabetizes stuff in the refrigerator, but that's oh. like another story. Yeah. Well, um, that, we could do another podcast on that. Maybe. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, but she recorded the date and the time that I said bird and what she was doing. And she was holding me in front of the window, and we were looking at the bird feeders in our yard. Isn't that cool? That is so bird. great. When my, my grandmother, Thompson, swore that my first word was junko. Junko. She was feeding me in the front of the kitchen window in a high chair, and she was pointing out the birds and telling me what they were. I was, I think, seven at the time. And no, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I, was I, I was however little you are when you're first talking, and you, you would be closer to knowing like one. Her, uh, like one. Yeah. So she's feeding me, and, uh, and she claims I said Junko. And she claimed that, you know, throughout my life. And, I believe it. Um, so we both have that as our first word. That's awesome. And my uh, my daughter's first word was owl. Okay. So that's Laurel. Laurel. Yep. Okay. That's. I mean, I think that's a good sign. I do too. It points in the right direction. It points towards greatness. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so speaking of greatness, your book is really amazing. I mean, Thank I, you. I I think it's a. Uh, of course, I love your first book, Cerulean Blues. When I read that, I. I kind of thought, man, Cerulean Warbler, I got to, and I, I told the guys at New River about you, and you came down. That was awesome, because that's one of our keynote species that everybody comes to that festival to see, and right. I think you've been doing that festival now a bunch of years, right? I think maybe maybe this will be my sixth year, yeah. I think. And, you know, why not get a somebody from West Virginia to come and talk about the West Virginia birds? Right. So that, that was a happy coincidence, and this, I got to say, this book is really even a, a step above that, because you combine the poetic with the scientific and your own kind of journey as well. There's a, I really, it's a, it's a really well done book. And I thank you. I, I, you've got to be proud of it as accomplishment. I, was it, did I it am. feel thank good you. to write? Yes. And thank you very much for saying all that. It means a lot to me. Now in the beginning of vulture, you say that the vulture is a perfect creature. Yes. Why do you think that? Well, uh, turkey vultures are not really predators. They're not mm -hmm. really prey. Um, they exist kind of in this, spot kind of outside the typical food chain or food web how we think of it they don't kill anything um and not much kills them so mm -hmm. they just kind of hang out and uh, wait for some something to die and mm -hmm. then eat it uh, they do a really important job of cleaning up our ecosystem yeah they're kind of the greenskeepers of yes yeah. they're, the, they're the peaceful recyclers mm -hmm. of the animal kingdom i mean if you think about if we didn't have vultures and other avian scavengers to eat dead stuff we would have First of all, a lot of dead things right. lying around. Um, we also could have an increase in mammalian scavengers. Um, you know, nothing against mammals in general, but uh, we spread rabies, um, distemper, uh, and uh, nobody wants to have rabid animals right. running around their right. neighborhoods right. cleaning up carcasses. Right. Well, and I noticed you said we spread rabies. I, I hope you're not speaking well. for all of us. <laughs> Speaking personally. As a um, mammal. Yes, yeah, a mammal. <laughs> Speaking for mammals, because I'm one that can speak. Um, you say also early in the book, and I really thought this, this really caught my um, imagination, that the flight of a vulture is a meditation. Yes. What, 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 describe what you mean. Uh, watching, I mean, watching turkey vultures fly is just one of the most beautiful things, mm -hmm. I think, in the world. Um, they hold their wings in that very shallow dihedral, that mm -hmm. shallow V. Um, they very rarely flap. Um, they very rarely look like they're in a hurry. Right. It's almost like they could be asleep right. up there soaring around. Um, and they just look uh, so beautiful when they catch a, a thermal and suddenly go right. way up in the float right. way up in the sky. I have a hay field in front of my house and I can sit on my hammock and watch turkey vultures kind of swooping and right. soaring over the hay field. And it's just very, very beautiful and yeah. peaceful. Yeah, meditative. Meditative, I guess, yeah. yeah. It makes you kind of, it's like watching a candle flame. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's I like that analogy. Yeah, the, the when I've taught beginning bird watchers, and one year I was out, this guy who played drums in our band at the time, 
and was a got interested in birds. He was a real estate agent, so he was always out all around this part of the state, you know, out and he'd notice birds and he'd call me, Hey, what's this bird? I said, Man, you gotta become a bird watcher. And I loaned him some binox and he eventually bought some. And he was constantly struggling for a while there with is that a is that a red tail or an eagle or is it a vulture? And I said, Steve, turkey vultures rock. And I did the, you know, the yeah. <laughs> the rock sign with my fingers. I said, Dude, they rock. And um, because they catch every little nuance of the wind, right? Mm -hmm. They just teeter and mm -hmm. like like you said, very lightly. Almost and, like they're trying not to flap. Right, right. No. Like balancing mm -hmm. on the balance beam of the wind or mm -hmm. the tightrope of the wind kind of. Yes. And so he liked that so much that he made t-shirts that said turkey vultures rock. <laughs> I would like to have one of those. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's, uh, I still use that because, you know, especially with kids, because everybody knows the rock, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's surprising when you, now that, of course, now that they're a year round bird, how often you right. see them. And, um, Speaking of them being a year-round bird, that's a, a question. I've, I've done a few talks about the book already, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talking about vultures is really fun, and I'm really glad I get to do it. Uh, but people will say, I used to see, I now I'm seeing vultures mm -hmm. all winter, and I used to not see them. Right. Why are there, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Are there more? And there might be a few reasons why we're seeing vultures in the winter in the eastern U.S. Um, one reason is probably that it's getting warmer. Right. Um, roadkill has been staying thawed. Mm -hmm. uh, the birds probably originated in the tropics, like a lot of our mm -hmm. migrants. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, keeping out of the cold is pretty important for them. So it stays warmer. It's good mm -hmm. for the vultures, mm -hmm. good for the roadkill. Also, we have more roads. Right. So we have more roadkill. Right. And the roads are, we try to keep our roads from freezing. Right. So we might also inadvertently, you know, keep the roadkill thawed also. Right. Well, I also think, you know, as the deer population, especially in this part of the world, has grown and that they've extended the deer season. So now there's, yes. you know, there's regular deer gun season, then there's archery season, then there's crossbow season, then there's muzzleloader season, then there's hair curling iron season, then there's right. butter knife season, <laughs> then there's primitive weapon season, then there's like chopstick season. And you can, you, know, right. you can yeah. kill deer in, in seasons that go for months, right. literally. And what do hunters do when they field dress a, a deer? Leave those guts. Leave those guts right there. And yep. Sit. And that's a trade-off. Yeah. Um, just like the roads are a trade-off. Um, I do uh, wild bird rehab, and uh, we get turkey vultures that are hit by cars frequently. Mm -hmm. um, we also get turkey vultures that suffer from lead toxicity. Mm -hmm. So the trade-off with the roads, using the roads for your food, is that you might get hit by a car and you know mm -hmm. become roadkill yourself. Um, the trade-off with the hunter-killed game eating a gut pile is that you might ingest lead. little pieces of lead, right. right, which can make you sick. Turkey vultures can handle more lead than a California condor or a bald eagle. Why is that? Because they're awesome. Because <laughs> <No. laughs> they're better. Yeah. No. Um, I don't know if we know exactly why yeah, it is. It's just a different, a different... Turkey vultures can handle a lot of... Because, you know, our president just... Uh, rescinded the order for ban on lead ammunition on refuges and right. so forth, and which I would, was so, I just couldn't so you pointless. And I would love to put a bald eagle in his arms that's dying of lead toxicity yeah. and ask him take it. It's a photo op. <laughs> yeah. Or have a vulture vomit. Vomit maybe. on him. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. But let's get away from our fantasies about right. that. <laughs> uh, what's your? Do you have? A, you must have a worst vulture vomit story. Um, baby, Even though you love them, you gotta. Yes, vulture vomit is kind of can be a little bit. It's effective as a defense. Oh no doubt. I mean, if a vulture vomits in your direction, you probably are going to move back. Right. Um, or if you're a coyote, that might be an easy meal, so you might eat the vomit instead so, of trying to eat right, the vulture. Right. But the most disgusting vulture vomit that I've been exposed to is a baby turkey vulture vomit. Oh, okay. I've been um, in helping with some. Uh, research projects where we go into vulture nests. Mm -hmm. We have the permits to do this, of course, into vulture nests and take some measurements and blood samples from the babies and put wing tags on them to um, monitor their populations mm -hmm. to identify them. So when a parent vulture feeds the baby, they're not carrying a fish back to the nest in their talons like an osprey. Right. They're eating roadkill 
flying back to the nest and throwing up and then the baby let, letting it letting it uh, gestate in their stomach for a while yes right? yes yes letting it, it partially digest mm -hmm. and then puking it up and then the baby turkey vulture eats it mm -hmm. and then you know here comes katie fallon into the mm -hmm. turkey vulture nest and the babies get scared and throw up let's test how much she loves turkey vultures. right yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of twice partially Happen. digested yeah. roadkill oh my goodness it's pretty disgusting. Yeah, yeah um, I, I've had um, turkey vultures in my in my cars mm -hmm. that have made it pretty stinky yeah. for a while. And I had a, a baby turkey vulture that we were taking blood from, the place we were using to put the baby turkey vulture down to yeah. do the blood collection and everything was the back of our Jeep Liberty, mm -hmm. and the baby turkey vulture threw up uh, in the back of the Jeep Liberty. Sure. And it smelled for you know I think months yeah. maybe every yeah. time I would get in I would have a just a hint of baby turkey vulture vomit. Nice. Yeah. Birds as sentient beings is, is something that, uh, a topic that a lot more people are touching on now. And I think we, we as humans think we're at the top of the totem pole of life and we're sentient and everything below us is, is sub, you know, could be our subjects and should be subject to our domination and we're smarter and more evolved mm -hmm. but i'm not so sure that is i mean birds have feelings i think and sometimes they can convey them Don't, i, do you I believe agree. that yes i completely believe that and it always is tricky when you're doing you know education with birds or something like that and uh you know we're taught to not anthropomorphize right that's and, and that's that's wrong to do I, that it's anti-scientific yeah, right right anthropomorphism bad non-scientific so it's something I think about a lot, don't anthropomorphize, right? But yeah. I think there are some, I think animals have emotions and I think that perhaps they're not human emotions, mm -hmm. but I think that they are still animals mm -hmm. having, they have some, some emotion. Like right. I, I think vultures in a rehab setting act completely differently than an owl or a hawk. Mm -hmm. Not that owls and hawks are not as smart as vultures, but um, they just look at you differently. Going by head size, you might think that. Right. The, the vultures are less smart, but. Right. But I mean, you know, a hawk, uh, <clears throat> this, we have um, a hawk, a non-releasable red-tailed hawk that we use for educational programs. And she's great. I love this bird. She's fabulous. But she mostly um, eats and sits in the sun. And she knows her, her one job is to stand on the glove and to go into her carrier, come out of her carrier, stand on the glove again, you know, mm -hmm. and then go back into her enclosure. And she does that really well. When you're doing presentations. When we're doing presentations, right. right. We have a black vulture who lives right next to her who's non-releasable. Uh, his name's Maverick because uh, he was hit by a car in the parking lot of a bar called Maverick's. Okay. Um, so Maverick's not releasable either. But this bird is just looks at you mm -hmm. and it looks feels like he looks into you mm -hmm. and wants to figure you out. And I spend a lot of time sitting in his enclosure with him. I give him toys. He has a bunch of um, Kongs and balls and mm -hmm. tubes that we stuff his food inside and he has to figure out how to get his food out. Uh, I was in there last summer and I had sandals on and I had a rock in my sandal. So I took off my sandal and he ran over and grabbed it and took it to the other side of the enclosure. and examined the whole sandal with his beak, the buckle, the straps, you know, the, the bed where my foot goes, and he picked it up a few times and dropped it a few times. And it was, it looked like a puppy. Mm -hmm. You know, it was... That's so cool. It's a, it seems like that's a thinking yeah. creature. Because you said in the book, the soul of a vulture is in its eyes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when a vulture looks at you, it's something is looking, is looking, yeah, looking through you. Yeah. When you look at a vulture, something is looking back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Why do you think our culture has such a negative impression of vultures? I mean, if, if they are these soulful, sentient, sentient beings that are doing this good work and nobody appreciates it, except the people in Hinkley, Ohio, we'll get to right. that in a second, but <laughs> uh, what's so the deal? I think that vultures remind us of our mortality, which Whoa. is um, kind of a psychological fear, I guess, that something is going to eat us when we die. It kind of reminds us that we're an, we are animals, mm -hmm. and that something is going to perhaps survive because we die. Mm. Uh, it puts well, us. Well, that's a big part of burials in many parts of the world. Like, yes, I mean Native Americans did that, of course. 
yeah. sky burials. Sky, sky India, burials. Right. Of course, when they had vultures in India, I was right. just there, and they, they're just you really don't see them. So yeah, Egyptian don't. vultures, and that's about it. I went to um, India. It's in, in the book, and um, a few years ago, and we didn't see any vultures the whole time we were in India. Not even I went specifically to find Egyptian vultures, and we didn't. They weren't at the site where mm -hmm. they used to be. A lot of black kites. Yeah, a lot. They're sort of filling the niche. Yeah. Right. And we'll, I want to come back to that in a second, but finish your... I think that vultures remind us that we are an animal and that we are part of that animal system, a natural system, mm -hmm. where, like you said, we humans often tend to put ourselves above the animals. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we are humans and we are in charge of everything and everything else is below us, right. when really a lot of animals will, would eat us when we are dead. Sure. From, you know, small bugs to larger things like vultures hopefully right. <laughs> um plants right that would you know pull our nutrients into their right into their bodies and, then, and and yet you know everybody knows anybody who's ever watched tv or the movies clint eastwood movies any western you know you you see the vulture somebody gets shot or they're walking through yeah. the desert and they're dying of, of thirst and they fall down, and immediately the vultures start circling and tearing, and then they play. They play the red-tailed red hawk, hawk call, because, right? Yeah, right. right. Yeah, they yeah that red-tailed hawk call gets used for for, for everything. eagles. Eagles, yeah. Yeah, because it sounds so much more macho than our eagle call. But and vultures don't actually. I mean, other than hissing around the nest. No, they don't. They have a. They don't have the same kind of searing searing right. the bird voice box. Right. They don't really have the same kind of searing that other birds have. So they really they just hiss. Mm -hmm. They can kind of maybe grunt a little bit, but it still sounds kind of like a hiss. I got near a black vulture nest one time in Maryland, and it, the uh, babies were in there, uh, two nestlings, and they it was like... Yes, yeah. It sounded like Darth Vader was in yes. this barn. It was really... I mean, it definitely put your, the hair on the back of your neck on yeah. goosebumps. It sounds of. like a large reptile. It does. Yeah. It does. <laughs> the, our largest vulture family member in North America is California condor. Mm -hmm. Nice comeback story on the California condors. Right. You want to describe your first encounter? Yes. So California condors, um, I saw five in the wild, which was really exciting. It's like 20% of the population. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, Ar yeah, in Arizona. Yeah. It's a, I saw them on the um, Vermilion Cliffs, which is uh, near the Utah, Arizona border, mm -hmm. um, near where they release them, right. near the release site where where they release the California condors that have been bred in captivity. Right. And I didn't have a, a scope. I just had my binoculars and my camera. And the cliffs were, you know, kind of in the distance. And we could see whitewash and, like, black blobs on the cliff. <laughs> and I took some pictures with my zoom lens and then zoomed in further on the back of my camera. And, and I yeah, could count it's them. It's a bird, yeah. And then we saw one come in and land. Yeah. And... One of the neat things about California condors, it looks like from underneath, which is usually when you see them, yeah. it looks like they're wearing deodorant. Right. They have like the white, white deodorant. <laughs> well, Antiperspirant, because it's the white cakey stuff. Oh, right, stuff. yes, the white cakey <laughs> stuff, yeah. <laughs> I like, uh, I, like I always that. say, you know, turkey vultures have silver linings, yeah. and they have silver all along the undersides of their wings, mm -hmm. and black vultures look like they have white hands, you know, white jazz hands. Jazz hands. Yeah, jazz hands, and California condors have, you know, Deodorant. deodorant. I love that. That's great. I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that right now. <laughs> and the, the California condor story has been you know, written about by other folks, but I wanted to put it in the book because mm -hmm. they are our largest vulture. Mm -hmm. They're critically endangered. Yeah. Um, they're, they were down to 22 individuals in the 1980s. Now they're almost at almost 500, I think, yeah. the last time I checked, um, in captivity and in the wild. And it's just a fascinating story. They're kind of, some people call them a bird with one wing in the grave. Yeah. Huh. Um, right. You know, kind of a relic from the mm -hmm. Pleistocene, the last ice age. And the only population of California condors left in the 80s was along the Pacific coast. Right. Where they were eating big whales right. that would have washed up or sea lions. Right. You know, things that are still kind of megafauna. Right. Where the inland California condors that would have been eating the big Ice Age bison and horses um, and other large Ice Age mammals that aren't around anymore, those populations of California condors went extinct. Right. And we had more vultures in North America during the last Ice Age that were bigger than California condors. Oh, wow. That yeah. would have, that would right, have they found them in the La Brea Tar Pits, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, one of the most common 
animals found in the La Brea Tar Pits um, is a bird called the um, Miriam's Teratorn, which is a big right. vulture. The whole that whole uh, group, the Teratorns, there were several species in that group, and they are all extinct. Mm, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. Um, speaking of population problems, how, vultures aren't doing great worldwide. No, worldwide. Um, of the 23 vulture species, I believe that 15 are of conservation concern mm -hmm. from critically endangered to near threatened. Right. Yeah, they're not not doing well. And is that largely due to kind of the similar path of a toxin through the system like DDT did, eggshells? In, in other words, I know that some of the, some of the bovine antibiotics, because everywhere in India there are cows. Yeah, they're all right. And think all those cows are getting some injection at some point, right. and when they die, the vultures come in and there. And there's something, one of those that's super lethal, diclofenac. Yep, yeah, diclofenac. So the Indian vultures in the uh, early to mid 1990s, people started to notice a lot of vultures kind of being dead, hanging in trees. Right. Um, and a lot of dead vultures around. And vultures in India, uh, there were a lot of them. Um, at, before the 1990s, clouds, clouds, lots, clouds yeah. of vultures. I mean, very, very numerous birds. Um, and you're right, India has a lot of cattle, but the majority of the um, Hindu population doesn't eat the cattle. They would use them for dairy. And then when they die, they would take the hides, they take the hides often for leather and leave the carcasses. And these clouds of vultures would come down and clean up these cow carcasses. And it was a great system. Uh, but the uh, it's actually it's an NSAID, so a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like uh, ibuprofen or something. For cows. Is, is, yeah, for cows. So folks would give diclofenac to their cattle as kind of a kind of a cure-all sort of mm -hmm. sort of drug. And then when the if the cattle died and the vultures ate the cow, then the vultures would go into kidney failure and die. Jeez. Mm, um, a veterinary uh, pathologist, Dr. Lindsay Oakes, was the person who figured this out. And he, uh, unfortunately, I dedicated the book to him, actually. Um, he passed away a few years ago, very untimely. Wow. He was a young man. Um, but when I went to India to look for these vultures that were in decline, my husband, we were really traveling to India because my husband had a veterinary conference to go to in okay. southern India. And Lindsay Oaks was also attending this conference. So we got to hang out and oh, wow. talk about vultures and... He's really the guy who figured out that diclofenac yeah. was causing these birds to die. So I got to hear him give a presentation about that. And, you know, we had a lot of meals together and he was a, a very, very kind man. And I went to contact him to interview him for my book. And that's when I learned that he had passed away. Oh, that's a shame. So. What are, what are, what's question? happening with the, uh, well, I mean, is there hope? I'm assuming diclofenac has been banned. Yeah, di and... yeah diclofenac is... Uh, banned in, I believe, India, Pakistan, and Nepal. Um, I don't believe it's been banned by the European Union yet, so I think they still might use it in the European Union and mm -hmm. perhaps Africa, although it's not as widespread in those two places as it was in Asia. And there's probably not the concentration of dead cows that are loaded up with this. Right. In, yeah, in um, Spain or something. They probably, yeah. Well, so it was there hope for the bird populations to come back? Um, well, there are captive breeding. I mean, some of these Four species declined by something like 99%, 97%. And then two other uh, species in India, Egyptian vulture is one of them, also have declined, although they're um, in other parts of the world as well. But there are captive breeding programs. Um, I don't know the how many they've been able to raise yet, but they're a long-lived bird, like California condor, it's not going to breed for a few years. Right. So you have to wait for the young right. birds to mature enough to use them in a breeding program. Oh, so it can, it can take a long time. Oh, boy. African vultures uh, also are having problems. And it's uh, not, not just diclofenac, but poisoning of carcasses is causing a lot of African vultures to die. Both poison carcass, carcasses to get at predators. Yes. Right. So poisoning carcasses by maybe herdsmen right. to kill predators right. that might come in and eat lions, their livestock. Hyenas. Right. Lions, hyenas. Right. They might poison a cow, cow carcass or something mm -hmm. in order to kill those predators and vultures are kind of the unintended consequence. Right. Also, poachers who kill elephants and rhinos, you know, for their tusks or their horns, 
will sometimes poison that carcass. So when the vultures land and eat, they die and they don't fly around over the carcass, mm. attracting attention from uh, law enforcement. So California condors do some strange things like they eat change like yeah. coins. Yeah. There was a condor that that Same. died a couple a few years ago from it was some it ate like 45 cents or something like that and it died. Um and there was uh there are other condors that eat that feed their babies um like nuts and bolts oh, and gosh. like bottle caps. Um and and uh I think that the idea is that maybe they're trying to supplement their calcium by feeding them what look like little shells or yeah. something but or grit. No, it, they don't need they don't have a crop, do they? Um, for digesting not, stuff not, in their not, stomach not acid. Not like thing. a dove or something. Does. Yeah, or so, chicken. Right. So I huh. don't. I don't know that folks have really pinpointed why they feed California condor parents feed their babies like nails and stuff. But yeah. it's it's. You can go um, online and do a Google Scholar search and find these scientific papers where they list all of the items that have been found inside California condors. Oh my gosh. I think a sandal. I think one one ate a sandal. Um, so they just kind of do things yeah. that we might not unexpected things. I want to bring us back from the desert southwest to here in the in the east where we have turkey vultures, but now kind of an influx of black vultures. I yes. mean, literally, I remember 15 years ago being so psyched that we got black vultures on a Christmas bird count because it was like, wow. Yep. And now, like, the, where there are power plants or big, huge smokestacks with a like a you know, an HVAC facility for a college or a state park, the black vultures are hanging around like hoodlums. Black vultures are they're definitely tough, increasing. Man. Yeah, and they're spreading north. They even get them in New England and yeah. places now. Yeah. And uh, black vultures um, are not as well studied as turkey vultures. And turkey vultures were not even really very well studied until, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. But black vultures are even less well studied right. than turkey vultures. They're, uh, you know, they're protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, but no one, I, I guess we don't really know if they migrate or not. I mean, some, the traditional wisdom is that no, they don't migrate, mm -hmm. but there's some suggestion that they might wander mm -hmm. pretty far distances, but mm -hmm. maybe not a true migration. And then some folks are suggesting that the black vultures in the tropics might migrate in response to migrant turkey vultures coming in, in the, in the winter. Okay. Um, so they move out a little bit. Although yeah. I've, I've heard and I've seen, I've witnessed this that at a at a carcass, black vultures will outcompete turkeys. Here they yeah. will. Yeah, in North America, black vultures will out, definitely outcompete turkey vultures. But uh, Keith Bildstein from Hawk Mountain, um, who does a lot of the research on turkey vultures, says that in the tropics, the gringo turkey vultures that come down from Canada and right. the upper Midwest um, will displace. Tropical black vultures yeah. because they're just so much bigger. Isn't that interesting? So we have big turkey vultures in North America, bigger than the tropical versions. Oh, I, that's cool. Well, that makes um, sense from that that you know that tropical. I can't remember what principle it is, but as yeah. you get nearer to the equator, things things get smaller, right, and paler, I guess. Um. um so so with the black vulture thing, though, to, 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 while I'm thinking of this, um, so right, more black vultures than we used to have. Um, climate change might be part of that. That we're things are getting warmer. Um, we also have more cities right. than we used to that would create urban heat islands mm -hmm. that would give black vultures a place to stay warm in the winter. Black vultures seem to uh, pick really fancy neighborhoods to roost in in the winter, like Leesburg, Virginia, I know, I wonderful know. town, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Right. There's some nice condos that went in on the west side of town here, and black vultures just hang there. And They're like, thank you. They, yeah. Why? The roof is probably warm. There's probably okay. the roofing material probably keeps them warm. So why do black vultures peel rubber? That's a question I get asked a lot too. So I don't know the the answer for sure. Right. But I can tell you my black vulture that's non releasable plays with things often. Right. Toys. I'm mean, like he like I said, he took my shoe and ran yeah. away with it. Um he plays with dog toys that we put in there. It's it might be boredom in part because these vultures uh, on the west side here are reported of taking the weather stripping out of windows, yes. taking the the trim uh, rubber trim from around car windows, shingles shingles off roofs. Yeah. they sometimes what will the do. Heck? It's also possibly that they're kind of waiting. They're kind of passing the time, waiting for it to get warm enough where they don't have to really flap to fly. Right. Um. You know that you don't often see them flying first thing in the morning. No, and it's interesting talking about flapping. That's one of the main 
uh, ID uh, differences that you can do between turkeys and blacks. Right. If you can't see the tips of the wings or the, the silver lining of the turkey vultures, I think black vultures flap like they're afraid they're going to fall out of the sky. They do. They look like they're having trouble. Right. Like, like, oh, struggling. Oh, oh, oh. like I'm struggling. Right. Yeah. They really want to catch that that warm air column yeah. and not have to flap. Well, they don't have as big a wing cord as as, right. as turkeys do, do they? No, and they're 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 a lot more comfortable on the ground too yeah. than turkey vultures yeah. are. They they almost seem more like a, a ground. They almost remind me of um like a shorebird that running on the ground. Yeah. Um. Than, than a turkey vulture. Well, you, but, you, you've got a PR problem with the black vultures because right. you know everybody all the the sort of farming hunting the you know we in this in this country and i think in part, lots of parts of the world black birds are seen as varmints right yes crows vulture black vultures Grackles and, yeah right i mean that's why down in the rice growing country in the you know gulf states they just spray avatrol over all the blackbird flocks because they're eating our rice damn it right and that's that plus you know the acid rain and the boreal forest is, is like hammering rusty blackbirds right. i mean i think that's one of the species yeah. that's going to be extinct probably in our kids lifetimes oh, if, it's terrible well i mean think about how they're getting crushed on both ends right um and well, i remember when black vultures first started appearing here the local i can't remember who it was like local soil conservation service or some sort of outdoor oriented thing like the same folks that do the coyote hunt mm -hmm. were like the, the letters in the paper the varmint right. black vultures they'll come in and they'll kill your livestock right they'll eat the eyes out of your horses right and, and your children so, and your children right. right right off the school bus they'll pull them right out of their blankets that's right yeah so there actually are people who are really afraid of those things the um there was a i used to live in southwest virginia near blacksburg yeah and there was a, a town called radford that i mm -hmm. write about in the book beautiful town on the new river that a lot of black vultures like to roost there in the winter. And there were people would be quoted in the newspaper as saying, I have a two year old, I'm afraid to go in the yard because of the black vultures. Right. You know, Jeez. and you only have to worry about it if you're, if, you know, your pets or your kids, if they're dead, right? And then they're not going to know right. black vultures eating them. Right. So uh, black vultures get blamed a lot for killing uh, newborn livestock. Mm -hmm. And I lambs don't, and lambs and, and calves and, I don't I don't doubt that they could do that. Mm -hmm. um, they probably do do that. However, I think they get blamed for it a lot more often than they right. actually do it. Uh, a group of black vultures, you know, they can be kind of hooliganish. They, they're they're um, very active. Right. Uh, they but they're also very smart birds and they will learn where births happen. Um, if you are a black vulture, you really want to eat a placenta from a cow. Yeah. I mean, that's an easy meal. There's no hide to get through. It's right. full of nutrients. It's very rich. Um, so they will learn where births are happening and hang out to get that placenta right. and all the other goo that comes out right. with birth. And then if there's a stillborn calf, I mean, that's a bonus. Right. right? And how do you know you're not, that's the, the vulture you know? didn't kill that stillborn calf right. before it was stillborn. So if a black vulture is going to kill something, it, right. it can't carry it off in its feet. It can't squeeze right. it with its talons because it has chicken-like feet. Right. So right. it's got to kill it with its beak while it's on the ground. Right. So for a black vulture to kill something with its beak on the ground, it's got to be something that's having trouble right. anyway. Right. Um, I uh, uh, talked to someone a few weeks ago who has sheep, and she said she was worried about the black vultures with her lambs. And then she said, I had a lamb attacked by something, and the lamb survived, but we're, we think it was a vulture. And she, um, you know, wasn't... You know, it could have been something else, though. And it turns out that the mother had died giving birth to yeah. the baby, which is a situation where any predator scavenger would mm -hmm. try to take advantage of that. Here's this tiny animal, and there's nothing to protect it, and it's weak. Well, how do you know that the mother's struggle during birth wasn't what injured the... The, the, the baby, right. Yeah. That, I mean, I don't, I didn't, I don't know the, all the, situ the right. entire situation, but, I, but I've heard people say... Black vultures killed a calf. I, I came out to the field and they were eating it and it was dead. Right. Well, obviously they killed it. Right. Right. So, I mean, that's I'm, like blaming the funeral director at the funeral home. <laughs> he kills right. hundreds of people every year. Right. And he gets away with it. Right, right, right. right. Now, and I saw, I've Googled and looked on YouTube for videos of um, black vultures, you know, black vultures killing calves. And right. most of the videos I have found have been black vultures hopping around on the ground, kind of around the legs of calf and right. the mother right 
and the mother's like kicking at him and they jump back a few feet and then they walk away and the mother kicks at him again and you know it, it was clearly not an attack right. it looked like a lot of the videos it looks like the mother cow has gross things hanging off of her still from right. the birth and the vultures are trying to grab them mm -hmm. <laughs> um so i don't doubt that they could if you had 50 black vultures they could mm -hmm. probably overpower something newborn and kill it but it probably happens mm -hmm. less frequently than it gets reported yeah. yeah interesting okay one more thing i thought of too if you're in an area where there are a lot of black vultures and you have livestock and you're worried and you're on fear because you there you might be very fearful of these birds they're creepy looking they're creepy looking and you might have a calf that's been born that right. is having a problem and you don't want that calf to die right. right um or you might have a mother who's not a proven mother who might not defend a baby against right. a predator bring those animals in right I mean, bring in your heavily pregnant animals or your animals that to you your think barn. are going to bring them into your barn or just close to your close to your house or mm -hmm. in a pen nearby you or something like that where you can watch them mm -hmm. closely. I mean, black vultures uh, are not like robots that are going to, you know. They're not brazen. Not brazen. They're not going, right. if, the, if you're, if they're not going to come into your barn mm -hmm. to try to kill a calf or something mm -hmm. like that. They're, you can, a human can chase them away. Would a scarecrow work with vultures? Think? I think they're too smart. For yeah. That. Okay. okay. Hey, but, that guy hasn't moved. Let's go down and eat his eyes out. Yeah, he's not moving. Right. Yeah. But I, I think I mean, if you move your pregnant or you know heavily pregnant or sick livestock close to where you can watch them, mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't be black vultures shouldn't be a problem. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, you were heavily pregnant, I believe, with a couple times Laurel when you went to Hinkley. Yes. Is that correct? I wasn't quite heavily pregnant, but, okay, I, was, but I was were, pregnant. Oh, yeah. you were, you were, yeah. It was so, yeah, that's right. I just remember that that you were with child and you were in, in this place and you, I, I thought the chapter was so funny, Q, when you bought the onesie with the vulture on it. Like, yes. How many people in America did that? I know. Well, you know, Hinkley, <laughs> Hinkley is great and it's, um, have you been to the. Uh, I haven't. I haven't. Oh, I've I wanted to go for a long time. The funny thing here, you know, has been like, the and I don't know if you talk about this in the book or not. I don't recall, but like they deny seeing any vultures until the March, Sunday, March yeah. the Sunday at, around St. Patrick's Day, right? March right? seven fifteen, seventeen, yeah, around right, in there yeah. somewhere. And so, like anything before then is a, an eagle or it's a hawk or it's a something Archaeopteryx, right. but it's not a vulture, not a turkey vulture, because right. yeah. they Cause always they show come up back the right. same day. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a there's a great story of that that um, so the festival. It's the um, Buzzard Sunday. Right. They, they, right. Buzzard Day. Buzzard Day, right in Hinkley, Ohio, which is near Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the Hinkley Reservation. Okay. Uh, so it's been, they've been having the Vulture Festival since the 50s at the Hinkley Reservation. And even before the 50s, there was a, a ranger there who claimed that for like the previous 20 years or something, he saw vultures on that same the weekend. Same day. Returning. Right. So they started having the festival, and it grew since the 50s, and it's a lot of fun. Right. I've only been there once. It's kind of campy, though, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, how could it not be? Right? But it's they vultures. do good, or, good educational stuff and kids' yeah, activities. Yeah, kids' and... activities. Um, the art that Hinkley Elementary School has a pancake breakfast, pancake and sausage breakfast, and the hallway was, like, lined with vulture art that mm -hmm. the kids at the school yeah. did. Um, and in the gym, there was a craft sale where they had just all kinds of vulture stuff. I bought wine glasses with vultures painted on nice. them. Nice. You know, and I bought, you know, they have kids clothes with vultures. They have um, yard signs, oh, magnets, nice. yeah. or Christmas ornaments. Aww. I mean, they have lots of stuff with right. vultures on it. And then, of course, um, out at, on Hinkley Reservation uh, at the park, there's a, an empty field with some trees, and uh, the vultures would all fly over the field, you know, to kind of right. go to the trees beyond and and when that first vulture flew over the field, it was, you know, spring had officially huzzah, arrived. Huzzah. Yeah. Now, at the pancake breakfast, do they, in the true spirit of vultures, does somebody eat that food first and then, and then they regurgitate it? it? Yes. Oh, that's, that's what the fire department does. Yeah, yeah that's right. really yeah. nice. That's got to be a great fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then, so Laurel was born. Yeah, so Laurel, yeah. Your little girl. And then you, you couldn't resist naming your second child at least in part you didn't name your second daughter turkey vulture or black vulture but you kind of yeah explain, right. explain so, that explain so, yourself woman. <laughs> well we tried you know we wanted to name our kids you know very birdie names but we also were a little nervous right 
like I thought a great name for Laura would be Cerulea, you know, sure, but then, of course. you know, I thought, well, that maybe that's a sure way to get her to hate Cerulean warblers. So right. but with Laurel, no, a nice, beautiful flower. Yeah. In the mountains. Um, in the mountains, the mountain yeah. Laurel. Right. So the day that uh, my second daughter, her name is Cora, that she was born the day after International Vulture Awareness right. Day. Right. So the day before Cora was born, we re uh, released a turkey vulture at um, the rehabilitated turkey vulture at Cooper's Rock State Forest. And then right after we released that bird, we had a call about an injured black vulture in a right. parking lot. And this is the bird that would end up to become Maverick. Maverick, right. We went out to the parking lot and couldn't find the bird. Right. Uh, and the next day I went into labor and had Cora, but we didn't know what her name was going to be. <laughs> we had a long list of names. Um, and then uh, the day after she was born, um, maybe our second day in the hospital. She was born in the evening and it was the next day in the hospital. So Monday, one of our volunteers called us and said, Hey, I caught that black vulture that oh. was in the parking lot. So Jesse That's went the one in that was behind the dumpster or something. Yeah, behind yeah. a dumpster. Yeah. So Jesse went into the my husband Jesse went into the animal hospital to check out the new vulture, left me in the hospital with the baby. And um he called me and said, This bird has got a shoulder injury that you know it's not going to fly well enough to be released i'm right. gonna i'm gonna go ahead and euthanize the bird and there's probably hormones from just having a child but i said you know let's can you not just not use not, not, not euthanize the vulture today yeah yeah so we ended up not euthanizing him ever the vulture and you know he yeah i think has a pretty pretty great life cushy life right play now play with sandals and kongs right and... yep <laughs> But anyway, after after that, I started thinking, you know, you know, how, how could I name my baby after this vulture somehow um, that she she saved really? Yeah. And the scientific name for a black vulture is Cora Gyps atratus. So, Cora came from it. that's great. came from Cora Gyps. Well, that's so, just super. So I named my sweet new baby after a <laughs> black carrion eating. Right. You know, Bird. And uh, to train her like a baby black vulture. Yes. You put her in a, in a cave and right. you go in there and puke up stuff for her. Yep, she eats my puke. Yep. Yeah. That's so awesome. You're, you're really <laughs> a nature mom. That's great. Well, Katie, it's always a pleasure to see you. This has been a fascinating hour conversation and it just went by so quickly. Yes. Thank um, you very much for having me. The book is Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird by Katie Fallon. It's published by the University Press of New England. Their imprint for Edge. It's a beautiful book. It's got a lot of cool images in there. And I love the little chapter uh, starts with the story, the life story of the vultures. I think that weaves. So there's your story. There's all the science and research that you're doing to tell the sort of the hard fact stuff. But then there's this little side story that's happening throughout. Right. So just to tell you a second about that, that was really fun to write. Mm -hmm. So in between every chapter, there's this little italicized section. That's the story of a female turkey vulture mm -hmm. who lives in Canada and spends the winter in Venezuela. Um, and I'm not sure if readers will, will um, get this or not, but it's an actual turkey vulture. It's a real bird named Leo, oh, cool. who is one of the birds that Hawk Mountain has put a transmitter on. Oh, neat. So I know where that bird is at every point, pretty much Isn't that cool? of its life of its year. Yeah. So I could write those poetic sections using Hawk Mountain's transmitter data oh, to figure out where the bird is and where it's going. Um, and Leo has is named Leo because she lives near Leoville, Saskatchewan. Okay. And she's been wearing a transmitter since two thousand seven. Wow. Um. And, and these these are wing transmitters, not leg well, transmitters. It's a backpack. Backpack, right. So she has a wing tag that she right. wears and she also has a backpack. Okay. And her mate does too. And she's had the same mate since two thousand seven. Wow. And they have separate they spend the winter in separate places. Right. So they have like it's probably why they're separate, lasted so probably long. why they're still together. Right. Yeah, separate winter vacations. That's so cool. But they go to this uh right around this area of the same farmhouse in Saskatchewan to breed and Leo goes to like the same grove of palm trees on this farm in Venezuela. Oh my gosh. So the very last section about Leo, I think I mentioned her preening her wing tag that I put her wing tag number on there just in case people wanted to look it up or something. They oh, can find cool. out that she's an actual bird. <laughs> well, isn't that neat? So if people want to follow the Leo. Um, yeah. Hawk Mountain's website, um, 
I don't know. Hawkman. It's maybe hawkman.org. Hawkman. Yeah. Uh, if you if you search through there and find their turkey vulture migration mm -hmm. studies, you mm -hmm. can probably find a map of where Leo oh, is and where Leo has been. Nice. Um, yeah, so they actually had to recapture Leo in 2014 and repair her transmitter yeah. and send her back out, which is also She's kind of doing some great work for science, isn't she? Yeah, so that's, I mean, 10 years wearing yeah. that transmitter, same, same mate. I have a neat vulture migration story that ties together Hawk Mountain and Whipple, Ohio, and uh, uh, Veracruz. So one of the birthdays of Hawk Mountain, I don't know if it's the 50th or the 60th, I can't remember, uh, my whole family, my mom and dad and uh, uh, Julie and I and um, my brother went over to Hawk Mountain, to Reading, Pennsylvania for their big celebration. And Julie had a bunch of art that was up. One of the paintings that she was um, displaying was a blue cystic turkey vulture mm. that she had seen fly over our farm here. I think I've seen that. It's virtually an all white bird with two black piano keys out on the secondaries, or maybe it's the inner primaries. And that's on. It was on display at this Hawk Mountain thing, where all their fun, you know, all their members and supporters came, and it was this big gala thing, and and we did a couple programs for it. And one of the interns was a guy uh, from Mexico, and he said, "I saw that bird in Veracruz. I've seen that bird in Veracruz," and we knew that that bird came up. He and, and he and he recorded the day and everything. And I don't know if he had a picture, but I mean this. What's, what are the chances it was another bird looked just like that? But he said, you know, and Julie had several other sketches, and he said, that's exactly the bird. So we saw it several years in a row coming by our place. That's cool. And then it would, it would, it would nest somewhere up by Barnesville, Senecaville, up 70 toward Wheeling, right? Mm. Toward uh, like St. Clairsville and Wheeling. And friends of mine, burger friends of mine from the Brooks Bird Club up there knew where it was. And they yeah. would see it regularly. And we even saw it one time driving to Pittsburgh. And I think it's long gone now, but I thought that was so cool that a painting in Reading, Pennsylvania, and a guy who just happened to be there as a former intern from Hawk Mountain recognized it. And of course, so many of those vultures go through Veracruz on their way. Yeah, and over, yeah, over Keckleby, mm -hmm. Costa Rica. And mm -hmm. um, I think, so what are you talking about? One of the reasons that makes it so interesting is lots of turkey vultures do that, right? Mm -hmm. But you knew that individual. Right. And that's kind of what I was trying to do with writing about Leo in the book, is that when you know the bird as an individual yeah. and not as one of the masses circling right. overhead, it really, you can really relate to that bird. Mm -hmm. This is an individual. I know this bird. Right. Yeah. It's not just a, one of the many right. multitudes. It's right. somebody. It's somebody. Vultures. That's cool. Well, Katie, thanks for talking to me. Thank it's you been very much, Bill. So awesome having you here. I I've been wanting to do this for a while since I got the book. Finally, got a chance to sit down and read it, and it's it's a fabulous book. I highly recommend it for anybody who loves um, great writing. Thank and you. It's a fascinating <laughs> subject, and uh, people want to learn more about you and what you guys are doing at your rehab uh, facility. What where, where where can they look? Um, if you go to katiefallon.com. I have links to everything you can oh, ever. Oh, katiefallon.com. I know, katiefallon.com. <laughs> there are links to anything on there. It's it's about me that you could ever want to know, which is far right. more than anyone and needs. <laughs> tell everybody the name of your uh, rehab. Oh, it's it has a long so. name that we thought about for a long time. It's the uh, Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. Okay. And it's uh, um, been around for about six years now. And it was founded by my husband and I and our friends, Todd and Aaron Katzner, okay. who are both bird people also and stars of the book. Yes. <laughs> um, and we wanted to make it uh, a place where, you know, we would do rehab. We rehab mm -hmm. all species of native migratory birds from robins and hummingbirds mm -hmm. to vultures and mm -hmm. everything in between. Um, we also have eight non-releasable birds that we do educational programs with and we sponsor a few small citizen science research projects. All right, Katie, thanks so much. Ah, thank you, Bill. Special thanks to Katie Fallon for our interview. You can keep track of Katie via her website, katiefallon.com. Funny how those things work out. Thanks, too, to Birdwatcher's Digest, our host for this first decade of this birding life. Nobody gets more enjoyment out of birdwatching than the folks who read Birdwatcher's Digest. You can join our family of reader subscribers at birdwatchersdigest.com. Special thanks as well to Carl Zeiss Sports Optics, makers of amazing birding binoculars and scopes, and the lead sponsor of This Birding Life. You can learn more about Zeiss and all its products and its community of naturalist birders 
at facebook.com slash Zeiss Birding. Carl Zeiss, we make it visible. And finally, thanks to the American Birding Expo, which is the world of birding in one place. Come and celebrate the birding lifestyle with us September 29 to October 1, 2017 at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Details and advanced ticket sales are available at birdingexpo.com. Finally, thanks to you for lending us your ears. We really appreciate it. If you have a comment on this birding life, please email me at editor at birdwatchersdigest.com. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, this is Bill Thompson III saying so long, and I'll see you out there with the birds. Laters. Laters.